He truly is so worthy and it is wonderful. It's also wonderful to be here in this place with you, church. Before we move on, would you take a moment to say hello to those who are seated around you? If you've never met before, introduce yourself. For those of you who are joining online, we are so glad you are here with us. Say hello in the comments. Tell us where you're joining us and be interactive through the whole service. We want you to know that you are not alone. Lifted up today, Lord, we sing. Oh, I throw up my hands, I'll praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart. to thankfulness. So I'm reminding my soul today, I'm going to worship. I'm going to give praise. Let's do it. Come on. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. No matter the situation we sing. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord, you're so worthy, so come on my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul.
child dedication. We have Zach and Tina up here dedicating their boy, Marty. They also have Lola and Tessa up here, which were dedicated earlier, uh, uh, years ago, right? So it's awesome. But what is child dedication? 
child dedication is simply this. First, knowing that Zach and Tina are dedicated to knowing our Lord and Savior, are dedicating to loving him and serving him, and then pouring out on that love on each other. And then what they want to do, they want to pour out that love on little Marley and Tessa and Lola to know who Jesus is. That's essentially what child dedication is. Isn't that awesome? Hey, buddy. So, and part of that too is for the church, for us as a body of believers to come together to encourage them and support them along this because we know that those of us parents, parenting is not easy. It's challenging, right? It's really difficult. So first right now, I'd like to have any of the, the family and friends that are in here right now, if you could just please stand or if you'd like to come to the front of the stage and take pictures, please feel free to do that because what I want to do is I want to just recognize you. For the family and friends, you play such a significant role in their lives because being part of that to, to knowing Jesus and teaching and raising the children to do that and being a part of, of their lives of Zach and Tina to, to come alongside them is such an encouragement and amazing thing to be a part of. You guys having fun up here? All right, so with that said, I just had the pleasure of knowing Zach and Tina and they shared a little bit of their story and they've been coming to Fox River for about seven years right now and Tina was just sharing me her story about, you know, she grew up Catholic and she was baptized as an infant. And when she came to Fox River, seeing the community and the love and how Jesus transformed her and Zach's lives, and she ended up doing Believer's Baptism in 2019 and dedicating her life to Jesus. Could we just give a round of applause for that? How awesome is that? Yes, family and friends up here taking pictures. So church, what I'd like to do, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna pray for them. If you could just stand a hand as I pray for this family. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this family. We thank you so much for the goodness of Jesus that you came and you died and you rose again, that you conquered sin and death, that now we have eternal life because of what you've done. Lord, I just pray for, for Zach and Tina that they continue to grow closer to you, Jesus. Continue to grow closer to each other as a marriage bond is supposed to be as husband and wife, to pour out that love into their children to understand the greatest gift a parent can do is to teach their kids about who Jesus is so they can walk in that freedom. Lord, I also pray for the church that you come alongside them, you encourage them and you equip them that we come together as a family as we're called to. Lord, we just thank you again for this time, for this space. Lord, we just thank you so much for your goodness. And we pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Hey church, can we give them one more round of applause? All right, church, we got a lot of things going on at Fox River, so take out, take a look at the screen here of what's going on for all the family stuff at Fox River. Let's not pretend we have all arrived when it comes to knowing everything about faith or what the Bible means. Scan the QR code to find out more about Alpha or to sign up for a Pray First gathering. Groups begin in two weeks. All right, who's excited for some soccer? Yeah! Upward Soccer is just around the corner and registration opens April 1st. Calling all soccer players. Not just soccer players, coaches, refs, and people who love selling ice cold drinks and scrumptious concession snacks too. Mm -hmm. Oh, I could totally ref. Let's go! Well then, you and you should visit foxriverchristian.org to stay up to date with all things upward. It's gonna be an awesome season. Hope to see you there. Hmm. Reminds me of my football days. Oh yeah, me too. Oh, oh. not that football. You should come <laughs> and do <laughs> some shit. What's up, Fox Super fam? Something exciting is coming our way on May 4th and 5th. It's Kids Sing Weekend. Oh, let's go. I love singing. No, it's kids singing. Kids singing. That means the kids will take the stage, not Isaac, during service to show off all their hard work. Yep, the songs are being taught during Fox River Kids classes on the weekend, so make sure to get to church so you don't miss out. For more information and links to the songs to practice, just scan the QR code and click Kids Sing.
Hey church family, my name is Kristen and I'm so excited to spend Mother's Day weekend with you. It has been a tradition here at Fox River to honor and celebrate moms and we will definitely do so. Every mom will receive a blessing and a flower during service and then families can get their annual family picture taken at the photo op. You know that one picture that mom actually gets to be in? Now don't get me wrong, I love all the mamas, but I am preparing a message for each and every one of us. I'm looking forward to leaning in together as we grow in faith. Be sure to invite your friends and family. This weekend will be a weekend of encouragement for everyone, no matter what season you're in. Scan the QR code for service times and details, and I'll see you there. Well, hello again, how you guys doing? All right, the mission here at Fox River is a heart for people in that message of Jesus. You know what, there's no age restriction on that message. All right, in the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five and seven, it says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. As I mentioned before, the greatest gift a parent can, can do is to teach their child about Jesus. And part of our role as a church is to come alongside you to do just that. It's, our, it's, our, it's a blessing for us, it's a privilege and an honor for us to partner with you as you raise your kids to know Jesus. So if your children have never been part of Fox River Kids Ministry, this is your personal invite right now. So Fox River Kids Ministry happens every week in the same time that we are in here at service. All right, it's birth through fifth grade and it's specifically tailored, right, for each child, for the grade levels. And what it's awesome about is it's fun, all right? It's faith-based and it's free. It's fabulous, it's fantastic, right? So it's all those things. So check out, if you want more information, talk to our student team, or our, sorry, our kids team, right? I'll get to the students in a little bit. Talk to our kids team, they'd love to answer any questions that you have about Fox River Kids. Speaking of students, students in the room, raise your hand, students, any students in the room? Parents of students, all right? So hey, Fox River Students is an amazing ministry. It's, it's super fun, faith-filled. They got summer camp coming up shortly. They got midweek, which is Wednesday nights for middle and high school. That starts at 6 p.m. That's where they come. They give them some food. You can't go wrong by giving students food, right? So they listen to worship music. They listen to a relevant message about Jesus, how to grow in their faith. They even break out into small groups. They do so many things. So check that out. That starts at 6 p.m. for middle school and 7.30 for high school. But also, the students here, they have the, uh, right in the atrium, go and check that out if you have any questions. It's called the Student Hangout. They'd love to be able to get to meet you, answer any questions that you have. And of course, you can go ahead and get more information on the student page or the QR code. Uh, speaking of QR code, I'm probably gonna talk about the QR code a lot, so maybe you can come, hey, you said the QR code like 14 times. All right, so scan that QR code, take out your phone, all right? So with that, hey, last but not least, all right, Family Hub. Family Hub is awesome. So right now what we're doing is we're switching it to quarterly. So quarterly means every month, but it's gonna be quarterly across campus specific, all right? So this is the time, 90 minutes. Actually, the next one is in two weekends, August 28th, right here at five o'clock. And that's what we just have, we have dinner, faith, fun, we come together, we meet new people, we grow in our faith. It's just an exciting time for the whole family. So go ahead, scan that QR code, or go to foxriverchristian.org for all the campus locations on Family Hub. All right, speaking of QR code, all right, if you're new here, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If you're new, scan the QR code, right? Click the new here button because we want to know who you are because we have an electronic Starbucks gift card simply for saying thank you so much for being here, and we really hope that you come back. So church, would you join me in giving a warm welcome to all our guests here today? Yeah. So Pastor Rob is gonna be up here just in a second, and he's gonna continue teaching the series Amazed by Grace. But before he does, check out what our friends here at Fox River have to say about God's amazing grace in their families. That question is a little bit harder for me. How have I been amazed by grace in my family? From day one, my mom has been attending Fox River with me. We've been able to extend invitations to my dad and my brother and my sister. All the events that we have at Fox River, um, my sister has brought her little two-year-old to some of those events, and my brother, um, who's not a believer, came and, and saw my baptism. And so all of those are acts of God's grace. And I'm waiting patiently for the day that the rest of my family, my dad, my brother, my sister, say yes to Jesus. I've been amazed by grace. My family themselves have been seeing me, you know, grow as a person, grow as a father, as a brother, 
cousin um, and an uncle to the point where them themselves are asking me like, hey, you know, where do I begin? Can I join you at church or can I sit next to you at church? Or even just at family gatherings, the people that never got along and you could not put them in a room together, now they are just basically just embracing themselves and just joking around, you know, it's such an awesome uh, thing seeing that in my family. The amazing aspect of grace uh, and God's working in my family is quite simply that my mom is alive. A little over 10 years ago, she succumbed to an illness. It was a mystery and we still don't, you know, have a lot of answers. Um, but she walked out of the hospital a month after being in the ICU like nothing ever happened. That is as close to a full-blown miracle as I can compare. And now with this current lock that my family is in um, with my dad, it's a sense of peace. I promise even though I'm crying, there's just this overwhelming sense of peace that I found and I think much of my family has found that God's in control of this situation. As scary as it is to be completely out of control with one's health um, and to have to trust the doctors and have to pray to Jesus for miracles and trust him for healing or trust his will to be done, to find a place where you can rest in comfort in such a turbulent experience is absolutely, absolutely awesome. So I have a little bit of a different predicament in that um, all three of my children are not saved, um, but I know they will be one day because I am praying them into it. So <laughs> they uh, have the anger still and the misunderstanding because they're not believers. They don't understand what grace is. So when um, I have these conversations at first, they think it's weakness. But then as they see my joy and my happiness and my calmness and content with things, they might not call it the word grace, but they know they've seen it. It's, it's almost a palpable word, right? Is that they can see it uh, within me. Recently, I've been asking God, why have, were you so gracious to me? Why did you give me such Christian parents? Why did you put me in a country where I could, I could worship you and in a town where I could enjoy stability and peace and great schools? I'm amazed by your grace. And, and my hope is that, that I can somehow take the grace you extended to me and share it with others. I've been able to plant little seeds, seeds of, of God in both of our families, um, with our friends, just little plants here and there that are, that are that is making our family and friends think. I'm learning to not react the way that I used to. Is this really worth making a big deal over or not? And most of the time, it's not. Everybody is deserving of grace. We are all imperfect people and we all need a little bit of grace along the way to help us through things. Amen. Amen. Hey, wouldn't you agree that God's grace is amazing, right? Let's thank him for his grace and what he's doing. It is great, great, great to hear stories of how God's working in individual lives and sometimes we just miss them because it is something that we attribute to something else at times, but we get to talk about grace today. I'm Pastor Rob. I want to welcome you to Fox River. Welcome those also who are joining us at Muskego, our North Campus, and really all around the world. Can we just, again, just thank God for the ability to meet together? Yeah. As I said, we're going to talk about grace, so I want to start off, kind of frame it up this way. I want you to come up with one word, okay? Just one word that would describe when I say, what do you see? How many have your one word? Okay, all right. How many, your word is roses? Come on, that's a simple one, all right? All right, as I was testing this out before service last night, one of the guys said, apology. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, only a guy would say that, all right? Yeah, yeah. And they say, I see thorns. Anybody? No. Why do we see roses and beauty and not thorns? Because the important part is the rose, right? Not the thorns. Which one, makes you wonder, 
do thorns actually have a purpose? And they do. How do I know? Because Google told me, right? All right. So I thought I need to find out why do roses have thorns? It is very purposeful. You see, because of their beauty, they're very attractive, right? Great color. I mean, this is one of the things that, that is just amazing in God's creation, just one of many. Then they have this fragrant smell, and they have these nice, tender petals. And so they are at great risk of flower shops and grocery stores. No, of herbivores. They would eat them if it wasn't for the difficulty in grabbing them, right? Up here, I think I'm safe. But when I get down here, it gets a little prickly down here. That's on purpose. Well, the Apostle Paul talks about a thorn that is also very purposeful. And its purpose is something that each one of us can benefit from. And its purpose was to be a reminder. When we think of thorns, you think of a few, probably really only one place in the Bible. A lot of times that takes us to a crown, right? A crown of thorns that was placed on Jesus' head. Well, this thorn is going to have some similarities to that, but it's really going to bring out the why of it. And as I mentioned, the thorn is a reminder. Who's dependent upon reminders? Be honest. I am. Every time I put something in this right here on my calendar, automatic. It's automatic. A reminder goes with it. So much so that sometimes they're annoying. You ever get annoyed by those reminders? Yeah. Sometimes I even start to tell myself, well, this event, it shouldn't need a reminder because it's that important. You know, like birthdays. Thank you for Facebook, though, now, right? And we know what it's like to forget. And it actually has saved me some grief, even though it's caused grief at times to have reminders. It has saved me because you ever get one of those texts or those phone calls? You know the one, the one that says, are we still meeting today? And you're like, oh no, oh no, I forgot. You have to raise your hand on this one, but have you ever forgot your child's birthday? Have you ever forgot your, let's turn it around, your parents' birthday, kids? <laughs> Okay, have you ever forgot your anniversary? These come in real handy at that point, okay? You might wanna grab a bunch. It's not a good thing. And so we need reminders in life of the important things. And sad to say, we need them even with the most important relationships, with things that we would think we would never, ever, ever forget, and we find that we do. The events themselves, they're not the important part. But rather, what the event is celebrating is the important part. But the problem is if you forget the event, the person feels like you have forgot them, which you probably really have. And so we need reminders. And so Paul's going to give us a great reminder of God's grace. Because I need to be reminded on a regular basis just how much I need God. Do you? And those reminders sometimes come through a thorn. We're in a series called Amazed by Grace, and we've learned that grace is amazing because it is unmerited, meaning we don't do anything to deserve it, and it is powerful. Last week, we learned that every single one of us has a grace story. And God wants you to share that grace story with others because he's doing a work in your life continually. He didn't just start it and then leave. He's continuing to do it. And today we're gonna learn that God's grace is sufficient. What does it mean to be sufficient? Simply, it just means enough. God's grace is enough. Every day, it's enough. Every hour, every minute, Every second, it is enough. Doesn't matter what else is going around you, on around you, God's grace is enough. Knowing that he's with you through it all, it is enough. Well, of course it's enough, right? 
then why do we live sometimes without that belief? Why do we let it slip? Because we need reminders. As I mentioned before, there's times when I forget this. And so Paul talks about the reminder as a thorn. So let's get to that thorn. If you take a Bible right now, if you would, if you got a physical Bible, turn to the New Testament, the book of 2 Corinthians. If you don't have a Bible, know it, you can get one really fast, really easy. In fact, I encourage you to do it right now. Go to your app store, download the Bible, the Bible app, and you're gonna be able to find 2 Corinthians. This is a passage you're gonna wanna go to, I think, throughout this week, and I'd encourage you to do so because it's got some great, great encouragement and great hope and it's gonna create a lot of questions. Sounds like a fun passage, doesn't it? Second Corinthians chapter 12. We're gonna read quite a lengthy part of it, verses one through 10. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. This is Paul, he's writing to a church, a group of believers. He says, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Third heaven is how Paul would describe where God is. When we talk about heaven and being there one day, that's the third heaven. The other two are in between there, here and there, okay? So he says, there was a man who was actually caught up to that third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. He's basically saying, I don't know if it was a dream, I don't know if he was actually in an out-of-body experience. But he says it again. He goes on, he says, God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. And he heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. I'll boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Anybody have any questions? Oh man, lots, right? What in the world is that thorn? He doesn't tell us exactly. There's speculation about it, but that's all it is, speculation. Why did he only ask three times? Because God gave him an answer. It wasn't the answer he asked for, but God gave him an answer. Maybe your question is this. How can weakness be a strength? Or the biggest one of all. Is God's grace really enough? Really? Is it enough for what I'm going through right now? Is it enough for what I'm gonna be going through next week? Is it enough for next year? Is it enough to last me my entire life? Is God's grace enough? It's probably the biggest question, right? And we need to live in that truth. But it's a hard place to live without the reminders that Paul is talking about, without our own thorns. And I don't just want us to learn about God's grace being sufficient. I want us to live in the sufficiency of God's grace. So would you join me in praying towards that end? Lord God, represented at Fox River today, Lord, at every campus, online, in every church, and even throughout the world. There are people who are struggling right now seeing that your grace is sufficient. And they need to know so deeply and desperately that you are walking right beside them and you have not abandoned them. And God, I pray that they would live in your sufficiency, that they would see the grace, God. They would feel the grace. They believe that it's true. I pray, God, that you would help and you'd bring healing, God, but most of all, you'd bring your presence. We praise you and thank you in Jesus Christ's name.
Amen. Thorn is sometimes unpleasant, but guess what? It's effective. There's no way I'm gonna forget if I go and just grab this, that I shouldn't do that. Because thorns are very effective. Partially because pain grabs our attention. But there are things that combat the fact that we need God's grace. There are. And Paul talked about his. You see, personal accomplishment can breed an unhealthy independence from God. You ever recognize that? You ever see that in your own life? Paul referred to it this way in 2 Corinthians 12, verse number seven. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Does anyone enjoy being conceited? Hmm, I have to think about that one a little bit. Kind of do. Maybe I should put it this way. You like bragging about yourself a little bit? Just a little bit? You like to tell people when you accomplish something? It's kind of fun. It is, right? Because we don't recognize. We don't recognize the damage. We can't get in other people's heads and hear and think what they're hearing and thinking when we're conceited. You see, we can recognize in someone else quite quickly that conceit doesn't look good on you, but we think it looks good on us. And so it's hard, it becomes a blind spot, in fact, and we need a reminder that it's unhealthy. And we need a reminder that it does more damage than it does good. And Paul recognized that in himself. You see, conceit is not flattering on anyone. Now, we still need to be successful. Please don't hear me say, don't strive for success. We need to strive for excellence, we need to be excellent, and we need to be successful. But we have to guard ourselves when that happens. Think about what it's like when you find success in different areas of life. Have you found success at work? Have you gotten a promotion? What happens when you get that promotion? You begin to get an attitude, right? It's kind of like that contract when, a, when an athlete gets that big contract and then it's like, what happened, man? How come they're not hitting any home runs anymore, man? Why aren't they scoring any points anymore? Because it's very easy to let that success go to our heads, right? It was kind of interesting. It was fun because it was playful banter, but I was at a restaurant where you could actually hear the cooks talking. And so one of them is talking to, you could tell it was his boss, and he basically told him, you need me. And his boss said, you don't wanna know what happened to the last guy who told me that. I'm like, oh man, right? But we can get that way. Thankfully, they were joking. We'll see if he's there the next time I go, though, okay? <laughs> but we know what it's like. What about... In school, is it possible to get a little conceited there? You receive a good education, you begin to believe you're the smartest person in the room, at least with the two subjects you just looked up on Google. But then you start to believe you're an expert on every subject you can get your hands on before someone else does. And you begin to think that you are the smartest person in the world on all subjects. It's so easy to do. How about relationally? Wow, are you popular? I can't even tell you how many friends I have. How many likes I have? Feels good, oh man, why did this person unfriend me? I can't believe, I can't believe they unfriended me. Well, who are they? I, I don't know, I think there's somebody I went to high school with, you know? And our pride takes a hit at that point. What about spiritually? What? Are you serious? Can you actually find yourself becoming independent from God spiritually? Really? What would that even look like? I'm so glad I don't struggle with something like that. I'm so glad. God, thank you. Thank you that I'm not a sinner like this person sitting beside me right now. Go ahead, tell them that, okay? Why don't you just tell them that? See how that goes. We wouldn't dare say those things, right? Man, I read my Bible every day. Why don't you? We still pray in public. 
in restaurants. You didn't pray before that meal? Man, hate to see what's going to happen to you. Yeah, expect a sick stomach later. Yeah. We can even get proud with God, thinking that we don't need God. And so what that means is this. We must not allow our capabilities to eclipse our character. And if it takes a thorn to give us that reminder, then we need to thank God for the thorn because that's a reminder that we have God's grace, that we have God's grace. Let me say that again. We must not allow our capabilities to eclipse our character. You see, once we begin to believe that what you have is earned or deserved, you're already in a bad spot. Paul recognized that he never wanted to go there. He'd been allowed to see unspeakable things because you see that guy that he said he was talking about, the guy that he knew 14 years ago, guess who that guy was? It was him. You can see it because he flips it a little bit later and starts talking about himself. You see, the apostle Paul, probably when he was almost dead and taken out as garbage, went to heaven, like real heaven, went to heaven and got to see unspeakable things and was told, you can't reveal all this, but you need to go and tell everyone you can about how to get to this place and what Jesus did for them. You need to do that. Now, imagine that mission. And he says, and I'm gonna send you back down to do it. Can you imagine that pressure? Hey, guys, hey, guys, just want to tell you about heaven. And when somebody says, well, how are you so sure about that? Well, because um, I've been there. I've been there. And to do that in humility, that would be quite difficult, wouldn't it? That would be very difficult. And so Paul says, so God, or Satan, Satan was involved. He says it's Satan, a messenger of Satan, gave me a thorn so that my bragging doesn't surface and do more damage than good. You see, he needed to be reminded that God is the main character in the story and not him. And sad to say, I need that healthy reminder too. If I put it quite simply, I have to be reminded, it is not about me. It is not about me. It is about him, and it always will be. He is the main character in the story. He is the one who gives grace, even though I don't deserve it. And he's the one who allows the thorn so that I recognize how much, just how much I need God's grace. When you have a thorn, you recognize you need God's grace. It doesn't mean that's where we go. But what is your thorn? What is it? As we talk about thorns, I'm not talking about things in your life where you're purposely saying no to God. That's not a thorn. That's self-induced is what that is. I'm not talking about an addiction. I'm not talking about you giving in to temptation. I'm talking about the things that are outside of your control that drop you to your knees or they should drop you to your knees and maybe you're not willing to go to your knees because you're still trying to control it. And you have not yet come to the point where you recognize, I can't control this. I need to go to God with this and I need to seek his grace and I need to come to the realization, yes, God, your grace is sufficient. What are those types of things? Again, Paul doesn't tell us what they are. They show up as weaknesses though. They do might show up as a broken relationship. Maybe you have a child that won't talk to you anymore and it's driving you crazy and you've tried to do everything possible in order to control that situation and just make it happen. Maybe you have a spouse who has said, I don't wanna be a part of this marriage anymore and you don't know what to do and you're reeling right now and the only thing you can do is go straight to God himself because he's got grace for you. Maybe there's someone that you just cannot forgive and know it, yeah, yeah, that's real. Because you're waiting for the thorn to be removed. God's saying, the thorn's not gonna be removed because my grace is sufficient. 
You can forgive because of my grace, not because the wrong was made right. That's a hard one, isn't it? It's like, I don't want God's grace. I want the thorn out. Maybe it's financial. And again, I'm not talking about self-imposed. I'm not talking about spending more than you should. Maybe you're in a position where because of a health crisis or some other tragedy, or maybe you were just told by your boss, we don't want you anymore. And you don't know where to go with that. And God's saying, I have grace. I have grace for you. That is a reminder to you that you need me. Come to me. Recognize, I'm walking here with you right now through this valley. I have never left you. I have not forsaken you. And I won't. Probably the hardest one of all. It seems like over and over, friends, family members, they come and say, I just got a diagnosis of cancer. I don't know what's next. I know there's going to be a life change. I don't know what's next. And God's revealing a thorn, a weakness that you can't strengthen because it's beyond your ability. And the only thing you can do is go to God in his grace and recognize and realize it's sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. Will you lean into it? Every thorn needs a healthy dose of God's amazing grace and he offers it to us. How do I know that? Because he gives us two guarantees right here in this passage. Thorns have a purpose. He says, when you are weak, you are strong. You notice what he didn't say there? He'll say it later. He didn't say, when you are weak, I am strong. Meaning God. He didn't say the only strength is my strength when you're weak. He says, no, when you are weak, you are strong. Because that's when people see a difference in you. That's when people recognize God's grace in you and through you is in your weaknesses. They don't see anything but you in your strengths. That's all they see. And God's saying, I want them to see me in you. Paul put it this way in verse 10. That is why for Christ's sake, this is a hard one. I want you to read these next two words with me because you're not going to believe them. That is why for Christ's sake, what? I delight. Now, what would follow that sentence if you wrote it? What do you delight in? Do you delight in any of these? In insults. In hardships. In persecution. In difficulty. He says, I delight. Now you're beginning to think, you are nuts, man. How did you get into the Bible with that type of theology? Whoa, my goodness. You got this backwards. Don't don't miss the last part. Why did he delight in those things? Because he recognized, for when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. My weakness can actually be my strength. Because in our weaknesses, God's power, his amazing grace can be seen by us and by others. But God has a second guarantee. We talked about a little bit up to this point. He simply says this, my grace is sufficient. It is enough. My grace is sufficient. Would you say that with me? My grace is sufficient. Now this time, let's say it like we mean it, okay? My grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. It is. You notice what God did not say? God did not say this, the removal of the thorn will be sufficient. But that's where I want to go. But you know what? It wouldn't happen that way. Because I'm just going to pick up another thorn. I am. And then what happens? It's all dependent upon the removal of the thorn. And sometimes that just doesn't happen. You know what else he doesn't say? And this is where I find myself going many times. He doesn't say, 
a logical explanation is sufficient. You ever find yourself arguing with God? God, if you'd please just give me an explanation for what's going on in my life, then I will trust you. No, you wouldn't. Come on. How long would that last? God, if I could just make sense of this thorn, then I'll receive your grace. Say, no, 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 no. That's backwards. That is backwards. You see, my grace is the only thing that will get you through this. My grace is the only thing that is sufficient. You see, do you realize that is the way you come to Christ and that is the way you continue growing in Christ? You see, if you've never recognized that you need God because you need a rescuer, you need a savior, then you've not received his grace because you're still trying to earn it. And the whole time he's saying, no, come to me, come to me. When are you gonna recognize you need me and my grace and it is sufficient for you? There are some things that go way beyond logic and they require us to trust in a loving God who's full of grace, who has not departed from us, but rather is walking right beside us. Allowing a thorn, but giving you a healthy dose of grace in order to endure that thorn. To allow your weakness to become strength. God's grace has power. And God's grace is enough. So what do we do with this? I want to encourage you this week. If something didn't come right to mind when I asked you what is your thorn, I hope that you'll recognize what is your thorn. Where are you seeking to be in control? Spending all your energy trying to control it. And God's saying you're not going to be able to control it. You're not going to. You're going to have to bring it to me. I want you to give it a name because I want you to bring it to God. And it needs a name in order for you to bring it to God. Surrender to God. You know what surrender means? A lot of times we think it means this. I give up, God. I give up. It's no, I give it over to you. I give it to you. I give it to you. And in response to that, he gives us something. And it's his amazing grace. We need to remind ourselves that they come, that grace comes in the form of guarantees. A guarantee that your weakness is your strength and that you're better off with that weakness than what you even realize. Again, I'm not talking self-induced. I'm talking things that are perfectly out of your control and that God's grace is sufficient. So just take some time, screenshot that, highlight it, write it out, whatever you need to do to keep in front of you. That passage in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, those are God's guarantees for us. And then pray. Ask for more of his grace, because he'll give it to you. He's wanting to give it to you, but you need to be the one who receives it. In the moment we're gonna pray, and maybe you've never received that grace because you haven't come to the conclusion that you need God. You're still trying to do this God thing without him. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? But maybe you haven't come to that point in your life where you recognize because of your sin that you need a savior. That's your first step. If you've already taken that step, what's your next step? What's your thorn? What is God using in your life to help you receive his amazing grace? Would you pray with me? With heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today, and you've not trusted Jesus as your savior, and he's revealed something to you, how amazing his grace is, that even though you didn't deserve it, he died for you so that your sins could be paid for and you no longer have to live in that guilt and shame of your sin because he forgives. If you're here today and you're ready to trust him as your savior, do so right now. Maybe like, what do I do? Just have a conversation with him. Something very simple. Maybe something like this, dear God. I understand that I am a sinner and I don't wanna live in that guilt anymore, that shame. I want to be forgiven. And I believe that Jesus died for me, that his death allows me to have life, a life free from sin and shame and guilt because you paid for it for me. I want to receive your gift of salvation right here and right now today. 
heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's you, online at our campuses, we just raise your hand, just give a wave, just let me know that you're trusting Christ as your Savior today. All right. If you're here and you're already a Christ follower, you'd say, I have some thorns. And I've fallen into a belief that God's grace is not sufficient. But I'm going to give control over to him. And I'm going to accept the grace that he gives me. And I'm going to trust him with it. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. I'm committing to God. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lord God, I pray for each individual, Lord, in this room, those who raised their hand, even those who have not. God, that we would look to you for your amazing grace. We would see it when it shows up in our lives. We trust you with that, God. That you are a God of your word who says, my grace is enough. We thank you for that. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And everyone in agreement said, amen, amen. If you made that decision to trust Christ, to receive him as your savior, We want to help you along this journey that you're on, this spiritual journey. So if you would, take time right now, scan the QR code, and let us know that you made that decision. We'd like to get some resources into your hands right away if we possibly could. In a moment, the band's going to come and lead us in one final song. But before we do that, we're going to take an offering. And the offering gives us an opportunity to show the generosity that Jesus showed to us. Obviously, not to that magnitude by any means, but just take a portion of what he's given to us and give back to him. So you can give electronically. You'll see different ways on our website um, through Venmo as well as crypto. Or if you have a physical gift you want to put in the buckets as they go by, you can do that. Otherwise, there's black boxes on your way out today. Have a great weekend, everyone. Church, would you stand with us as we sing?